Hi, I'm Nate, and you're watching Photo Learningism. I want to do a special edition tonight, our very first collab going over Krita and some different techniques and styles. I'll be coming at it from the photography view. I have my sister-in-law, Nikki, joining in, who is a graphic digital artist, sort yeah, of. Yeah, something like that. I also got the nice chair. Yes. Yes, I'm in the wooden one that doesn't do anything. So <laughs> we're going to dig in in just a moment. Let's get to it. Just taking a moment to highlight uh, Nikki's work up on the screen um, so you can take a flip through. This is uh, the ArtStation link. I will put a link to uh, in the description to her website and uh, to this as well so you can enjoy the fine work that she is doing. Uh, these are all in Krita, correct? Correct. I paint uh, entirely in Krita right now. So these are really awesome. Take a dig through and uh, feel free to, to follow her and see what she's up to. But tonight, we're going to be looking at Krita specifically. We both did a special project inside of Krita. Uh, again, I'm looking at this from the photographer's perspective. I took this picture you're looking at right here. Ooh, uh, going back, I don't know, even know. It's, it's been I at least... It's on my wall. It's the first <laughs> one we bought from you. It's about two or three years old, at least, probably more than that. Um, but yeah, one of the first pictures that I'd really taken on a reasonable camera. And um, I wanted to return to that do some new work on it and show you and kind of explain my process and then Nikki uh, has also done some artwork in Krita coming at this from the, uh, the graphic and digital artist and uh, we'll be commenting through and sharing with you how we work on these things. You can see the different uses of Krita and uh, the value that that tool brings and by the way Krita is a free tool open source it's hard to go wrong that way. It's also free to give it yeah. because it's a free tool there's a uh developers on it all the time. They're always adding new functionality and improving things when I get frustrated with, oh, this doesn't work right. Um, the community also is frustrated with it and the, uh, the developers work on it. So it's always worth uh, donating to the Krita project. Absolutely. Yep. So I'll put a link to the, to the Krita tool as well down in the description. Uh, please go check that out and, and support them. So I'm going to start this off. I made a pre-recording of the uh, process. And again, this is Krita. Um, it's not the the latest edition. They put out new editions about every uh, month or two. Very regularly. It's a very yep. live um, development. Yep. So, I mean, this one has the latest features. A lot of the other uh, releases are, are bug fixes or enhancements to performance. So you're not gonna, you're not seeing like large leaps through every release. Um, so there's not a lot to worry about there, unless you're having a specific problem, in which case, you know, by all means, go check the releases. But for here, I'm demonstrating a technique which I've talked about in my other videos. If you hadn't seen them, please go, feel free to go check those out. In uh, cloning, you're using the actual cloning brush. That's how it is represented in the uh, Krita tool. Uh, other tools, it's a, a tool on the, like on the left side, but in Krita, it's an actual brush that you have to select to do the cloning and the replication. It's that one that looks kind of like the Z in the lower right hand corner. Um, what I'm doing at the moment, you, you might see me kind of doing some trial and error because some of it kind of is, <laughs> in all truth. But it's a technique where you are using multiple layers to clone. You you will borrow parts of a, of a separate layer and then draw with that on, this, on the next one. Here in particular, what I'm doing is I'm adjusting the hardness coming out of the box. The hardness of this brush is very, very soft. It's very feathered. And for this, I wanted the edges of the brush to be very hard because I wanted a hard edge on it. I wanted to get a sharpness to this. You can see when I zoom into that berry that it's it's a little bit blurred because that wasn't in focus and I wanted to fix that. <laughs> so, yeah, I've got the hardness I wanted. I think I make another adjustment in a little it's while. Capacity. Yep, I'm trying to make it so that it draws in, but it's not so bold. We're trying to get it done subtly, but also make the enhancement. Um, so yeah, the brush is going to move around a lot and dance around a little bit. Ha! That's where I uh, accidentally made an extra point. <laughs> had to delete it. <laughs> You're pretty good with the brush adjustments. I haven't actually learned. I use a lot of um, free brushes that come with the program. Where with um, other users create free brush sets, so I use a lot of those. I haven't explored that very much, um, and I'd be curious to. I, I, I haven't seen any that's specifically for photography yet. It's mostly for painters, so I, mm. I wouldn't have even thought to adjust the clone brush. Yeah, this is really the first time that I've, I've had to make something this oh, sharp. Oh, you, um, you got it. Yeah. I like it. 
and in a lot of times, I mean, you really do want yeah. that brush to be very feathered because you're you're going to be painting or removing digitally, altering and removing out stuff that you probably don't want. So it needs to be very soft and it needs to be very, very subtle. I might have tried so. to do the same. Uh, if, if you'd have asked me to get the edge off, I probably would have done a select tool and kept the clone brush soft just because I don't brush edit. I wouldn't have thought of it. Mm. But yeah, this is uh, this is the process that I've found that works good for what I'm gonna do, and you end up with a little bit of, of overshadowing, which I'll remove later. So I kind of go through it. That down. Yeah, uh, but this is the process that I found works. And also, by the way, if if crit is not your thing, um, by the way, this same technique will work in other tools as well. I've done this in Paint.net. Um, I can't remember if I've tried this in GIMP, but go try it if you're curious. <laughs> if that's your. I haven't used GIMP for a long time. Yeah, I hear a lot of folks say that GIMP is the closest match to uh, to Photoshop if you're coming from Photoshop. Personally, I've used Photoshop in the past, and the next place that I went to coming out of that was actually Paint.net. I found Paint.net to just be very intuitive. It's very simple, but it's very effective like that. And knowing how the shortcuts worked and how those pieces worked, I found the leap also very simple coming into Krita. I found a lot of commonality in how the developers of that tool designed and how the developers of this tool designed. And there's a couple nuances because everybody likes things just a little bit different. But in that way, I found that coming into this tool was, wasn't so hard. It was, I was able to settle in yeah. quickly. No, I had made a first couple of painting attempts on a very early version of a tablet from like Taiwan or something. <laughs> um, what was that, 2003? Um, and my hardware was not able to handle it, but I made some images on GIMP. And uh, a couple years later, I was approached by, actually asked by credit developers to try out their tool. <laughs> and. Um, at the time, you had to like bottle it or something. It was too technical for me because it was only on Mac. You know, they, I mean, they had their own. Um, it, it comes out of another development system. Okay. And it was part of like a whole suite of programs. And I was like, well, I'd love to, but I'm not savvy <laughs> enough. So eventually, they they brought it to Windows. So. Uh, I've been here for so oh wow! Much. So you've been even before it was ported. Wow. Yeah, they contacted me on DeviantArt and. Yeah, because I was working on GIMP at the time. So, yeah, Nikki's a longtime veteran of this tool. <laughs> <laughs> well, as soon as it came to Windows, I, I wasn't that early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as long as I've been with it, it's always been on Windows. So that's, yeah, before I knew it. Um, yeah. So here you can see me trying to fix up the top. This can happen if you're drawing based on multiple layers, and I'll come back and I'll redraw again kind of based on another layer because what I'm trying to do is get get some sharpening going and things will happen uh, depending on where the brush is and what you're trying to borrow from but you can always fix that layer. That's the beauty of working between two different layers is that something between the two is still intact. It's not destructive. So, yeah. yeah. And then this part got a little interesting because I realized that I had to, to work berry on top of berry and not with the background so that caused me a little bit of <laughs> temporary adjustment. A gradient in the berry as well, so that also gets more and more interesting. So. But you can get a good idea of how this goes, um, this particular process. I used the same ideas uh, way, way back in paint.net because I wanted to see if I could isolate a tree. Um, it was a shot in a cemetery, and there were lots of things behind it that I didn't want. There were other trees. Uh, there was a mausoleum <laughs> um, and I wanted just the tree so I tried this same idea of uh, taking multiple layers I washed out most of the tree and the background I blended over the sky and then I went back and I borrowed the tree just branches one at a time it was extremely tedious but I was literally drawing cloning uh, the branches back onto the one that I had just so you kind of got the tree and not everything else behind it because who wants to <laughs> who wants to cut out a tree <laughs> by drawing it out so that worked out really well it's like you're painting but you're painting with other pieces of the painting mm -hmm. that's exactly it yeah yep so 
that's where I spent most of my time on this one and I uh, just wanted to go through the effort to, to make things sharper while I was working on it. Oh, so now you're erasing back? What are you... Yep. What happened is that I brought in a bit too much. I just wanted the edge of things. And if I remember right, what was I doing there? <laughs> I think I was just trying to bring in some more of the background. I'm going to clean that up as we go through. Yeah, because I left a little bit of the extra to, pieces like, over there. Details. You can see how well that worked out around the bottom side of yeah, that, though. Yeah. And I'm going to come back and clean this up as well. But yeah, the result was really, really good. I see. So you're preserving mostly only your clone right along the edge by peeling it back. There we go. Yep. And this is usually how I'll do some of my tonal adjustments is uh, I like to add an overlay, which is what I'm doing now. That really pops the color a lot. It's kind of like you're adding a layer of itself which then emboldens all the color. <laughs> yeah, I learned this from you from my painting too. <laughs> yeah. I do adjustments at the end now, uh, overlay, and um, the other one I do all the time, screen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, they do slightly different things. I love overlay just because it picks the color in particular. And then a um, little bit of adjustment in the end because I want to, this is almost like a contrast adjustment because I, I want to get the depth of it just a bit more. I think I played with adding in the dreaminess to it, which is a little bit of volume and blur, yeah. as an overlay, and then oh. you kind of tone it back so you don't lose all the sharpness, but if you do it right, it adds kind of like a dreamy quality to the overall picture. I can't remember if I kept that or not. <laughs> we'll find out together. Yes. Now this is a very interesting thing. There's probably a better way to do this, but this is the way I found in that I will make a black and white layer mm. and then overlay that. And you can see what that did yeah, yeah. is that that sharpens it up even more where you really see the span of color. Yeah. It just has a way as an overlay of, of picking out the finer details. Somehow that works. Don't ask me how. <laughs> There's a few different black and white modes too, so you can choose like the luminosity level mm. and focus on either your medium tone, your middle tones, or your high tones, or, or your darks. <clears throat> so that is the end, and that was what I ended up with, which I just thought that breathed a whole bunch of new life back into this picture. Um, so I, I love this did shot. Did you do like a compare, contrast? I did when I was kind of crafting this. I don't know if I have it immediately ready at this moment. But yes, this this one did come out more colorful than the last one. It just it has a, a greater yeah, sense to it. Richer. Yeah, it's Yeah. So that was the, the version that I did. We're going to flip on over here to uh, Nikki's creation. And I'll let her guide you through that. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I generally just start on a second layer and sketch out. So I was working with his source image. Um, I don't have it on the recording. I don't know why I didn't record the little window, but I use a program called Pure Ref, um, and it just is a floating window with my source image that I can drag anywhere and um, turn and move around. It's, a, it's a, the best little free program if you're a painter um, because there's nothing better than reference, um, which I wish I understood when I was starting out that you need reference. You don't just draw from your head. Um, That's absolutely true. Yeah. Yes. I tried drawing a, uh, a raindrop once, and it came out completely wrong out of my head. I had, <laughs> had that. <laughs> yeah, our memory reduces things so that we can, you know, manage the world. And then when you're actually trying to draw them, you're like, I've seen a bazillion birds, but the idea of a bird right now sounds like an alien. It might as well be because I don't actually remember the proportions and you know the details. So, That's yeah, reference is the way to go. Pure ref. Pure ref. Yeah. Try to put a link in the description for definitely, that as well. Definitely, that's one of my favorites. Is that a free tool? It is a free tool, and you can even if you're not a painter, you can use it as a kind of a mood board, and it saves the mood boards, and you can share them with friends and stuff like that. And um, it's great for planning anything 
artistic or otherwise, you know, you can just, you literally can drag and drop images from the web onto it and then save the board. It's the easiest thing for collecting images. That sounds really cool. Yeah. I may have to make a video of that later Yeah, it's on. a very easy tool. It's absolutely <laughs> one of my favorites. Check that out. So please. here I was just trying to um, choose the background colors. It doesn't help because I didn't put the source image in for you, but I'm not super great at choosing colors by eye. I've been just trying to practice it. Um, but I felt like there was a cool, almost bluish tone on the top of the source image and then like a warmer um, undertone. I was messing around with how detailed I was going to be with the background, which you'll see me go back and forth with in the whole video. Um, I set, I think I eventually said a lot of being pretty simplified because I didn't want, I wanted to be more of a study than a, a complete render. So I try to put like, when I'm working with something that's pretty bright, I try to put a really bright undertone. You can in fact start with orange when you're painting any one of any skin skin color. You can go in with that bright orange as an undertone and it, it tends to work. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. I guess we all run the same color blood. It was about at this point when I was watching this through for the first time that it finally hit me because I didn't know which picture she was drawing. Wow, she's actually drawing the picture. I asked him this for is what awesome. Was, I asked him for what he was working on. I, I do a lot of draw, Im, drawing imaginary characters and stuff like that, but when I study, I study from life and I use a lot of photos. Um, I've in fact gotten better at just taking photos with my cell phone just for that purpose. Cause, mm. you know, oh, it's a cool mushroom or, yeah. you know, it's an interesting blend of colors in that oil puddle or whatever. <laughs> So now I have way more pictures of things than people. <laughs> I actually put that on my New Year's resolutions. Take more pictures of people. <laughs> mm. That's a good one. And by the way, cell phone photography, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what I did for years, and that's a perfectly fine way to start if you're interested <laughs> yeah. to do that. Take pictures however you can. Yeah, and then I learned a lot about how to control my... I have an older cell phone, how to control it, and how to deal with them. Like I wanted to take close up pictures, but everything time I try to get up close, it would get blurry. So I learned to get real close to my subject and then take one step back and then use the <laughs> zoom a tiny bit and I would get sharp pictures. And it took me a long time to figure that out. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. doing the tap focus on my yeah, other yeah, phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get, get, get. <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, there's also a lot of free, um, wonderful image sources like Unsplash and um, Pix. Pix Excel. Um, I can give you the links to those as well, sure. but they're really just full of images and they're all copyright free. They're, they're meant to just grab and go. So I never awesome. feel bad about, you can do a study on your own of anybody's images, like you can still frame a movie, anything you want, but then if, if you're going to share it or sell it, you come into copyright issues and you want to be honest. So yeah. um, if I'm going to put something that I might share as a print or use in some other way i i generally only source from those uh, from my own photos or if i've asked a friend for permission to use like one of their travel photos or you know um from unsplash or another free site the splash yeah sounds good now i noticed just quickly jumping back there yeah you, you, you were spinning the thing around a little yes, bit yes so that... that was what i like when i first got into credit and i was trying to memorize all the things just rotating i was like oh, i can turn it and i actually can't tell you from my memory how i do it it's like control space bar or something but look up the rotate tool it's mm. like as a painter rotate and mirror <laughs> mirroring i don't do it on this one because i usually use it when i draw like a face or, or an animal or something uh, yeah, yeah, but when you mirror an image you can immediately see what you're doing wrong it's, a, <laughs> it's like oh it looks it looks off now i know um I might mirror once or twice in here, but I definitely rotate mostly because like if you have a tablet, if you have like a piece of paper, you can turn it, you can turn your hand, yeah, you can move around. Sense. So it gives you more yeah. of a natural approach, you know, because you're only right or left handed. Your your curves tend to go naturally in one direction or the other. So rotating is definitely one of the best uh, painter tools. And when I start out, you don't like see too much rotating, but when I get like really into it, it keeps turning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... I haven't done a lot of work with rotating, um, but I do tend to, you know, I 
to do the other two axes a lot where I'm moving mm. in and out and zooming yeah yeah a yeah. lot of my more experimental videos which I've made in the past it's it's that's what the video looks like is that it's kind of like I, when I started <gasps> I used to zoom in a lot uh, back and forth but I actually stay zoomed out as much as I can until the very end and the reason is because as a painter if you get into details too fast um, you're just in the weeds mm. um, you have to stay kind of big bigger strokes a longer time mm. and so I learned to stay zoomed out for as long as possible it also makes it easier to draw curves and things like that because you want when you get used to the the pressure sensitive pen you want a nice smooth curve and when you're zoomed in too small you're gonna get jagged edges mm -hmm. and ridges and stuff so you want to be pulled out away from your subject in order to get more control of your um, curves and motions that's interesting yeah which actually brings up another interesting point um, that yeah Nikki uh, was using the the digital pad um, to do this uh, as was I a much smaller one by, for my drawing but yeah that that was part of our process for for getting around right. this and I found that that's a really invaluable tool especially if you're gonna be working with with steady lines is that you just need to simulate the pencil as much as possible I mean I've gotten pretty good with the mouse but the angle and the rotation of the wrist just kind of gets awkward with time and you just need to be able to I did start drawing with a mouse when I started too that was a little rough yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I started with a, a Wacom bamboo tablet just a little guy and I learned on that and I could still be using in fact I, I pack it now with my with my uh, laptop I still use it um, but I now have a Huey on tablet mm. Yeah, they, they seem to work very well. I have a smaller one of theirs. So it has like tons of buttons on it, but I never <laughs> use the buttons. I use the undo a lot. Undo, but... <laughs> yeah. I love undo. Uh, so, oh yeah, here I'm using like a, a one of those um, burn tools. Yeah. I guess you call that. To get that bright yellow out. It just kind of sucks it out. Yeah. yeah. And I tend to, when I paint, I tend to use almost just like an oil painting, just one layer. But because I get scared, I, I work on one layer and then I flatten it and then I work on one layer and then I flatten it and I do try to keep the background separate from the subject but otherwise I'm just flattening and I it it boggles my mind because a lot of painters I know use um, just layer after layer and they label them you know this yeah. would be fruit one fruit two fruit three oh, stems that, yeah. little stem you know <laughs> and I I just don't work like that but I'd like to learn because eventually uh, one of my interests would be to do more um, concept development art in that you definitely want things on separate layers so that you know you can change the color of the jacket or whatever but for for studies mm. and for general painting I just do layer flat layer flat layer flat gotcha. so yeah Krita is a, a tool developed against using um, particularly the uh, the drawing pads that's one of the things they specialize in yeah, they um, do a good job keeping up to date on getting the tablets to interact with the program well, too. Yeah, better than really any other piece of software I've seen, uh, commercial or otherwise. Yeah. That's looking better than the picture I took. <laughs> it's interpretive. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. Thanks. Yeah, that one in the background kind of looks like the Apple logo where somebody took a bite right. out of it. So. <laughs> so I guess I'm just to end up here. This gets into more nitpicky details, you know, how, how the foreground and the background are interacting and mm -hmm. how much of the strokes I want to keep or not. Um, and I don't... I guess you can't see it again because my recording program for some reason like you see me operating the menus but you don't see the menus dropping down I have to figure out how to change that setting in my recording program but um, um, I'm starting to change my brushes around because I tend to just work with one brush for probably I don't know 70 80 percent of the process mm. before I start using uh, different types of brushes I just tend to work with a, um, a hard round brush really mm. Um, in fact, the soft round brush I really only use for laying in color at the beginning along with the gradient tool and then it's just the hard round brush. And now when I want to get more character in it, you'll see see my outline of my uh, cursor there has more of a strokey texture in it. Yeah, and that's yeah. just to get that painterly feel <clears throat> on top. That also kind of helps a little bit with like the blur type yeah. of thing in the background, yeah. Because this, this was a macro shot, this was... Uh these berries, I'm not even sure what kind of berries they were, but they were about that big. <laughs> so, very tiny. 
Yeah, your source image reminded me of something that was really personal to me, which is kind of why I was excited to do it when you shared it with me. Um, he didn't know I was going to be painting it, like you said. Um, but in about, it was the end of 2016, before I really dug into um, digital painting, like full bore, as I had touched on it before, but I had been having some trouble with my personal development and what I wanted to do. and. I had um, been going to a farm um, every couple times a, a month and, and collecting, um, I was like a member of the farm, so I was getting a farm share, and I wasn't going to be able to keep going because my family demands. Um, yeah. And I was really sad. So I was sitting in this field looking at dried berries, there were three of them, and I took a photo of them and I wrote myself a little story about what I was going to do next, and that was when I decided to get into digital painting, so when I saw your your photo of the three little berries, I was like, <laughs> you know, this is where it started for me, so this is kind of cool. Well, I'm happy to be a part of your journey in that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You've done a lot of characters, uh, as we saw in right, the beginning, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I'm really, um, really interested in getting into narrative storytelling, um, so I have to break a little bit next out of painting and get more into drawing, which surprisingly are different um, fields because painting is like focusing more on your values and your hues and these kind of strokiness like you see me doing here but um drawing is the lines that are not quite as much field color and so it requires a lot more precision and decision making and here with i paint i just paint back and forth back and forth until i find the thing i like and mm -hmm. i i need to learn the flow of working with lines which is like a different But I absolutely love uh, drawing characters, especially when somebody hires me. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, are you still accepting, accepting jobs? Um, well, right now it's the school season, and I'm a mother of six. So I'm not really taking a lot of jobs right now. I'm working on a book cover. Um, but you can get in my queue, um, and we'll see where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> But in either case, yeah, don't hesitate to check the website. We'll have that sure, in the yeah. description. You can follow along with what she's up to and doing. Um, you're also on YouTube. Yeah, and, a little uh, bit I'm on YouTube. I'll, I'll try to post some more. Yeah, I teach an art class, so I'm always making videos, but they're private, so I have to figure out what I can share. And there it is, the signature. I actually, I kept redrawing the signature, which is... <laughs> <laughs> A good sense of it. There you go. <laughs> and that's like the best part of digital painting is that uh, if you, you don't put like, it exactly yeah. Where you want it. <laughs> I didn't ruin my painting with my signature. <laughs> do the same thing with my logo. It's just where do I really want this? Yeah. It's great having that freedom. Yep. Yeah. So those were the two things. Um, I really do hope that was uh, helpful and informative for you. You can kind of see this again from the, the two different angles of working on it, from photography and, and digital touch-up versus uh, graphic and, and, and painting uh, design. Uh, any comments, we would love to you join in, uh, join the conversation below. Uh, follow the links, follow Nikki and uh, see what she's doing. And do come back, so uh, subscribe and give me a thumbs up if this was helpful, uh, particularly if you enjoyed the collaboration. We, just might try to do more of those if that was helpful and if this was uh, beneficial to your art technology experience. So join us again in the future. Take care. Thanks, guys.